going to talk about trend analysis and machine learning in PHP. Uh, very quickly, before I get onto that, who am I? Uh, that is a very ugly photo of me that is awfully big every time it goes up on a projector. Um, my name is Michael Cullum, and my Twitter handle is on there as well. So I'm up here for the next 45 minutes. Um, I, you can tweet abuse at me, feedback, thoughts, um, just photos of me if that's what you enjoy tweeting um, uh, whilst I'm up here. Um, so and that'll be in the corner of my slides as well. I work for a company called Sam Knows. Sam Knows we do lots of buzzwordy stuff like machine learning or big data. Um, but basically we monitor uh, internet performance, which is, I promise, more exciting than it sounds. Um, I'm also uh, Symphony security lead, so if you ever ha uh, spot something you might think is a security vulnerability in Symphony, uh, I'm the person you'll be chatting to about that. Um, I'm also on the core committee of the PHP FIG, which is kind of like a standards body um, forum for collaboration sort of throughout the entire PHP community. And finally, I'm on the management team of a project called PHPBB, which you might have used 15 years ago when your sites got hacked once a week um, and were inundated with spam. Uh, PHPBB still exists, 25 million ins uh, installations, um, and it's a lot better than it used to be, built with Symphony components and that kind of thing. So if you're interested in hearing about any of that, come chat to me afterwards. Because you're all here to hear about artificial intelligence, right? Machine learning, artificial intelligence, yay! <laughs> Exciting buzzwords. Uh, I actually hate buzzwords, that's, that's the thing about me. Um, and artificial intelligence is a complete load of rubbish. Uh, so that's not what I'm going to talk about. A true artificial intelligence, in my opinion anyway, is when you can fully mimic a human, when it can understand, not just be able to sort of repeat instructions or uh, get better at doing a particular job. Um, and to do that, you probably need to like examine how brains work and how like the neocortex works and how you can reproduce that as a computer instead of just writing algorithms. Um, I'm here to talk about machine learning. Um, and so machine learning is just as it sounds, it's machines being able to learn things. Now, we're all engineers, right? Um, so one of, our, one of the main things that we do in our jobs is we teach computers how to perform tasks. We write code. Um, that's our way of telling a computer how to do something. It's giving it an instruction list, um, and then it completes that, that, that instruction list. Uh, when you're teaching a child how to brush their teeth, you give them a series of instructions as to how to brush their teeth, and then they know how to brush their teeth for the rest of their lives. So machine learning is something that every single one of us does on a day-to-day -day basis, right? That's just development. Um, but we can go a bit further with that, and that's what this talk is kind of jump a bit, a little bit more into, and how we can use statistics in order to get it to uh, learn and discover more, more, more intelligent things. But before we talk about how machines can learn, I think what we actually need to look at is the process of learning. Uh, who went to school? Great, most of you. Um, <laughs> Now, at, at school, we learn subjects like geography and maths and history, and maybe some of you did computer science or, or, or the like, and biology and physics. And that's great, but that's not what school is actually designed to teach you. Um, school is designed to teach you basic numeracy and stuff, but you pick that up sort of within the first few years, generally. But then the skills that you learn later on, what you're actually learning is you're learning how to learn things. Um, that's, that's the main basis of school. How many of you in your current day-to-day -day jobs do things that you were taught in school? Like, how many of you were taught programming in school? Okay, a few of you. Um, but the whole point is you learn a lot more stuff after you left school. And that's the point of school, learning to learn. But it's very hard after you leave school to actually think about what, what that process actually is. What is the process of learning? How, how does learning work? Um, despite it being the entire fundamental point of school, um, Nobody really understands it when they come out of school either. Um, so I think maybe there's quite a lot of, uh, um, uh, probably a problem with their education system there. So I tried to, I tried to try and uh, come up with a theory of how learning works. So we see a cause and effect. Um, so for example, I, uh, I've got my, sort of a part of my clicker here. Um, and if I drop that, so my sort of releasing that's the cause, I then see an effect, which is that it falls to the ground. I then process that in my head and I add some context. I add the context that I'm on the planet Earth. Um, I add the context that I'm not dreaming. I add the context maybe that I'm in this room um, or that I'm in, I'm in San Francisco. And I add that to my, my knowledge base, to my, to my database in my head. Um, 
And that's the learning process. I see a cause and effect, or I observe a cause and effect, I process it, I add context, and I store it into my head. But if you learn everything in the entire world, you wouldn't exhibit yourself as an intelligent human being. And I would like to think that most people in this room are intelligent human beings. Um, so we then need to use that learning process. So we see a cause, and we look back in through sort of our heads and what we've learned and what we've observed in the past, um, our knowledge base, um, and we predict something. And prediction is the foundation of human intelligence. When you walk outside, you're predicting that the sky is going to be blue, or maybe grey if you live in the UK. Um, so it's all based on how you predict things. And therefore, without that, you're not intelligent. So I, because of previous experiences, I know what happens. I've dropped this uh, part of my clicker before in this, in this very same room, uh, just sort of five minutes ago. If I drop that, then I'm predicting it's going to fall to the floor. If it stayed in midair or it started traveling upwards, I'd be really rather confused. Um, that's not to say that couldn't happen if I was next to a black hole, for example, um, it might go off in a completely different direction or if I was on the moon. But from what I've seen and what I've learned, I predict that it's going to fall downwards. So that's the entire learning process sort of put together. We see a cause, we see an effect, we process that, we add it to our brains and to our knowledge base, we then see a cause and then we make a prediction. So we can apply this saying quite simply. Um, I'm going to program into my computer, I'm going to write this program. Um, it's a big switch, so. Um, I, if I have 1 and 1 plus 1, then I'll return 2. If I have 1 plus 2, I'll return 3. If I have 2 plus 1, I'll return 3. If I have 1 plus 3, I'll return 4. And if I have 3 plus 1, I'll return 4. Simple, right? Big if statement. I store that into my knowledge base. Um, basically, I save that PHP script with the big switch statement in it. And I add it to my knowledge base. So then, when I give it 3 plus 1 and I say, what's the answer? Um, and I'm asking for it to predict the answer, it will give me four. Simples. Big if statement, right? Um, now, we want to be able to take this a step further. We, we as humans don't just like learn things um, and can only apply it to that very specific situation. Um, when I dropped my uh, clicker earlier, or part of my clicker earlier, I the reason that when I first dropped it, I've never dropped it standing in this particular place before. I've never dropped my clicker standing in San Francisco. I applied the fact that I've dropped this clicker before when I've done this talk on many different countries and sort of uh, in different um, instances, um, or and I've dropped other objects before and I've seen them fall to the floor. So I inferred something. I inferred that no matter where I am, if I'm on Earth and I'm not dreaming, if I drop something, it will fall to the floor. Um, and we can make computers do the same thing. So if I give it a series of different things, and I say uh, 1x plus 3 equals 4, and I give it this extra number, 1, um, and it knows it has to do something, it doesn't know what it has to do with it. Um, and I give it 1x plus 3 equals 5, and I give it this extra number 2, and I give it 1x plus 4 equals 6, and I give it this extra number 2, and 2 plus 3x equals 8. Now, what it can then sort of infer from that is, because it knows how to multiply, say, if it says, OK, well, I see that in all of these equations there's this x, and I don't know what this x does. But if I take this additional number that I'm being given, and I multiply the number that's right by the x, then the equation makes sense, and it resolves. So if I then give it 1x plus 4, and I give it this extra variable 10 that kind of just like floats around there, um, then I can say, OK, well, I know that if I multiply whatever number is right by the x by this extra variable 10, um, then I'll get the right answer. So I can say then the answer is 14. I've just learned how to do algebra um, without being told explicitly anything at all. I just knew how to make an equation resolve. I didn't know about x and y or anything like that. And as humans, this is also how we learn as children. When, when you're a child, you don't know English. You can't communicate. Nobody's giving you an instruction list. Um, but yet, you learn how to speak English or other languages if English isn't your first language. You might hear this noise, eggs. And it might commonly be associated with this object that you might see that sort of looks like this. Um, you might commonly see people putting it in their mouths. So you assume it's food and edible. You don't know what food is, but you see that people put it in their mouths, and therefore that, that kind of makes sense. And then later on, when you're learning uh, how to read and write, then you'll learn EGGS. Uh, and one of, the, one of the biggest pitfalls with learning a language is when people try and learn it in a very academic sense and they get taught this equals this. That's not how you learn a language. You learn language the same way you do when you're a child and learning it for the first time. So that's learning. 
So if we look at now, if we now look at how machines do learning, it's an easy four-step process, right? If we, if you, you can break down anything, no matter how complex it might be, into a four-step process. So this is how you do it with machine learning. First of all, you acquire some data. Second of all, you train a model. Thirdly, you ask it a question. And then finally, you get an answer. Simple, machine learning, done. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's the end of my talk. That's, that's the four-step process. Um, if we, let's, let's jump into a few of those in a little bit more detail, though. So first of all, acquiring data. And this is the hardest one for me to actually talk about, because it really kind of depends on your use case um, or what you're doing. But generally, it's always the hardest part of the entire process. Uh, say that you want to do some machine learning, some analysis on your log files. If you haven't been collecting any log files for the past five years, you need to first of all start collecting some log files and build up a data set that you can then run some tests on. Um, and you'll need to have some instances where you're of, of the thing you're trying to detect. If you're trying to detect when you suddenly see a spike of 404s, you should have an instance in your already existing data set of a high number of 404s. Um, if you're uh, trying to look at buying habits of, um, and trying to see, okay, people that buy um, uh, nappies also often buy uh, baby milk, um, you need to already have that data. So the first thing you should go home and do, um, or maybe even get your laptops out now, is turn on your logging and start collecting as much data as possible. Because realistically, it doesn't matter what format it is, it's in right now, you can convert it later, but you've got to start having that uh, data there already so you can start to play with it. So all I can really say about this stage is good luck. Um, uh, I'm sure you'll manage it. Um, training your model. This is, this is, this is probably the most, uh, the most technical part of it, so I'm going to go into this in quite a lot of detail. So there are two different kinds of learning. There's supervised and unsupervised learning. We'll talk, we'll talk about each in turn. So first of all, you've got supervised learning. And supervised learning is all about where you know the specific outcomes of what you're trying to achieve. Um, so it's where you're saying, for example, in classification, I know that it's going to be either A or B. Um, unsupervised learning, on, which we'll talk about in a bit, is much more about discovering things. Supervised learning, you might give it a data set which you already know all the answers to. So you might say, this one is A, this one is B, this one is A, this one is A, this one is B. Um, now, that can be quite, that's very manual initially. Um, so, and you need to have a very clean data set when you're doing that initial supervising. Um, alternatively, you can have a huge data set which is extremely difficult to then do the actual manual training to then give it to it. Um, but we'll have a look at some, uh, some parts of supervised learning first. And again, we're going to have a look at sort of two different sort of sub subsections of that. We're going to look at classification um, and regression. Um, so classification is all about being able to say something is one thing or another. Um, you're trying to classify something uh, as an enum. Um, so, uh, for example, it might be good or bad. Um, it might be true or false. It might be red, blue, or green. Um, so let's have a look at a, bit, a contrived example. Um, we're going to have a look at talk ratings of a talk. Um, so people say, say this talk. Um, so a few people gave it different ratings. One person gave it 100, another person gave it 25, another person gave it 50, another person gave it 40. And what we want to be able to achieve is we want to be able to look at a rating and say whether or not that person came away fe feeling that it was a positive experience or a negative experience. We want to turn this, this number into a, um, into a, into a cla into classified into good or bad. Um, so for us in order to be able to do that, we have this training set. And so these four, these four people that rated the talk, we actually asked them, we said, was it a positive or a negative experience for you? And the people that said 150 said it was a good experience. And the people that said 25 and 40 said it was a bad experience. Um, so I put this on a chart, on a graph, on the, on the right-hand side. Now, I appreciate this data is quite easy to visualize. Um, there are only four things on there. Um, it's quite easy to kind of see where that, where that line versus good versus bad is. But as we'll see a lot later on in the, in the talk, uh, graphs are incredibly useful for visualizing data that is very hard to see patterns or classifications and that kind of thing um, uh, without actually just plotting it. Eventually, if you're sort of doing machine learning and you've got 150 dimensions, um, you can no longer plot that on an X and Y axis. Um, but when you do have only two axes, it can be very helpful. And particularly when you're trying to see, okay, does this machine learning model match my data? Being able to visualize that and as a human saying yes or no can be very helpful. So 
We added a bunch more and we kind of decided that our line sat here just here below 50 as to whether or not it was a good or a bad uh, overall experience. Um, and then what we could do is we could classify all of these other torque ratings. So another person gave me a 75 um, and we classified that as they came away with a good experience. Um, another person gave me, I think that's maybe a five, um, and they considered that a bad experience. Um, so, you know, it's kind of, it makes sense, right? And as humans, we can see that's obvious. But a machine, it needs an algorithm. It needs some way of telling it uh, how to handle that. Um, now, that was quite simple. If it was over that number, it was good. If it was under that number, it was bad. But let's have two different dimensions to our data now, two different variables. So we have a series of people, and we give them two tests. We give them a test in PHP skills, and we give them a test in sales techniques. And we know that in this group of people, there are salespeople, and there are PHP developers. And we want to be able to give them a test that can basically say, OK, that person's a sales person, and that person's a PHP developer. We want to be able to distinguish between these two groups just by giving them a test. Um, we don't have access to their HR files. We don't know what their actual job is. So we give them two tests, and we plot their test results. Um, so along the bottom, I appreciate at the back, maybe you can't see the bottom, heart, bottom part of the slide. Um, so along the, along the uh, x-axis, which is the one that goes across, we've got the sales test results. And along the top, we've got the, uh, the y-axis, we've got the PHP test results. Now, for the sake of um, which we, this is a, this is a training set, it's supervised learning. So I'm initially the initial uh, piece of data I'm giving it, I'm telling it whether or not it's a PHP de developer or a sales uh, person. Now we've got this green line here, um, which is this one sort of labelled H3 over here, and we can see that on one side of it we've only got salespeople. So that's a good uh, um, uh, model if we want to be able to determine someone is definitely a salesperson or we're not sure because on the other side, we've got a mix of both. So that, in some situations, might actually be considered a very good classifier. But we can quite clearly see, as humans, that's not the best one there. So we try a different uh, model. And we've got this um, uh, blue line here, which is labeled um, H2. And this also looks, per this does look perfect, because on one side, we've got all the PHP developers, and on the other side, we've got all of the salespeople. So that's our perfect classifier, right? We don't need to do any more work. Except again, as humans, like looking at this, um, and particularly because we're graphing it, we can see that actually that's probably not the best, uh, best way of doing it. If we add another, um, uh, another person takes the test, for example, and they do particularly well in the sales test, but they're sort of still up here in the, PH, in the PHP test, then immediately we'd say they're a salesperson. But actually, again, as a human, because they're in that top left qu uh, quadrant, I can see that they're probably actually a PHP developer. So then we've got this final line, which is uh, H1. Um, and uh, the red line, and we can see that's probably the best classifier there. That's the best. That's the best model. Um, and we'll have a look at some algorithms as to that can determine these different lines a uh, bit and a bit later. So that was all about classification. Um, now we're going to look at regression, which is all about dealing with continuous data. So. In this instance, we're going to look at the size of some prints um, and the price of them. So we have one that's 8.25. Uh, we're in the US, so inches. Um, and the price of it is five dollars. We've got another print that's ten inches uh, and it's six uh, six dollars. Another one that's six point seven five inches and it's four dollars and so on and so forth. And again, I've plotted these on a chart because, as I said, I like plotting things on graphs. And I hope by the end of this talk, you will also like graphs. Um, so I've plotted them, and you can quite clearly see like a, a general direction here. The bigger the print, the more expensive it is. Now. Say that I want to have um, a new, a new. I want to. I'm the. I'm the vendor here, and I want to have a new print, and I want it to cost one dollar fifty, and I want to see how that would kind of fit into my overall uh, pricing strategy. Um, and I can quite clearly see if I put an extra sort of point here, one point five, I can see that that would be two and a half dollars if I wanted to fit it in. So being able to sort of determine those extra things, and obviously that's a bit of a contrived example. I can decide whatever price I like. Um, but again, it's just about being able to extrapolate and interpolate that data, um, seeing on different places on that line. So that's supervised learning. If we have a little bit more unsupervised learning, it's all about discovering brand new things, things I didn't really know before. So for example, I might want to see um, if I work in a supermarket or an e-commerce platform, uh, I might want to look at people who buy this product also often buy this product, um, something I didn't realize before. 
Um, and again, we'll talk about sort of two different individual parts of this association and clustering. Um, there are obviously hundreds of different sort of smaller sub, sub areas. I can't talk about them all in this talk because I could have an entire conference and I still wouldn't scratch the surface of them. Um, but these are just some of the more common um, uh, sort of areas and things that you might want to have a play with. So we'll look at association. Um, so I work in an e-commerce store and we have a loyalty card, uh, loyalty card scheme. And I'm looking at all the people who bought two products um, and that's only 10 people apparently. Um, or eight people, sorry. Um, and I want to see what products people often buy with other products. So I start to draw some assumptions from this data. I can say people who buy socks also often buy underwear. That makes sense. If I go to a shop, I, as a human, I can, I can understand that. I might also often buy underwear. They're things that kind of go together, right? But also from this data, what my algorithm is telling me is that people who buy underwear always buy socks. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but I live in a free society, and there are shops that sell uh, underwear without me having to also buy socks. I am able to buy just one of these two objects and not buy both. Um, but as far as this algorithm is concerned, it's never seen anyone do that. It's never seen anyone buy uh, underwear without buying socks. So because the training set was really small, it makes a, a false assumption, it makes a mistake. In the same way that we as humans, um, uh, when you're a child um, and you're always learning new things and sort of you get, you get confused when you see something weird happen. Um, you know, I'm, I'm used to the sky being blue or grey, for example. Um, but then if I went to sort of Iceland and saw the northern lights, I might be quite confused that the sky was suddenly green and purple and changing um, and think that I was having some kind of dream. So everything that you, like machines will make mistakes based on how much they, how much they know. And the larger the training set, the older you are um, as a human, the more, you, more, the more you know, the more you've observed, the more intelligent perhaps you are. Um, and it simply just comes down to observation. And that's something that applies to humans, but humans have just have significantly more experience than a machine does. So that's something to bear in mind. The larger your training set is, the more accurate it will be. Um, but it will make mistakes, 100%. And you have got to bear in mind that it will make those mistakes. So you can't rely on it. Um, we can make other assumptions here. People who um, buy suits always buy black shoes and vice versa. Um, and so on and so forth with sort of other relations there. And again, it's just making mistakes because that training set is really small. So give it as large a training set as you can. Um, clustering. So I was trying to find a definition for clustering. Uh, and I sort of, I did the usual thing. I looked at sort of um, Oxford English Dictionary, um, Merriam-Webster, I looked at Wikipedia, um, I looked in some books, and none of them really gave me a definition I liked. This was, the, this was the one that the Oxford English Dictionary gave me. Cluster analysis is a task of grouping a set of objects in such a way that objects in the same group are more similar to each other than those in other groups. It's very wordy. Um, I was just like, sorry, what? Um, but if you, if you break down and you sort of look at the kind of the points it's trying to make, then it kind of makes more sense. It's looking at, it's trying to do some kind of grouping of things, right? That makes sense. Um, it's not just stuff being in different places, it's grouping of things. Um, and it's things that are more similar to things in their own group than in other groups. That's not to say that they're the same. It's to say that they're more similar. And again, that means that you will make mistakes. If you, for example, are looking at a series of different people um, and you're trying to work out their, nation uh, their citizenship, for example, their nationality, and you have an American who has spent their entire life, they have an American passport, but they've spent their entire life in Britain. They have a British accent, they have British uh, culturalisms, um, you know, they, they understand, um, uh, they drink tea and not coffee, um, all of these kinds of different things. You might assume that they're actually British. So just because they're more similar to people in that particular cluster doesn't mean that they actually belong in that particular grouping. So again, it comes back to that whole thing of it can be wrong and you've got to keep that in mind. So here we're just looking at, again, some sort of classification of, uh, uh, of points. Um, on the left-hand side, we're able to do this with straight lines. Now, if you can do anything in statistics with straight lines, then your job is done, it's super simple, and you can go away very happy very quickly. Um, but straight lines don't always work. Um, as you can kind of see on the one on the right-hand side, it curves around. Trying to do that with straight lines is hard. So 
with these clusters, we can see those cl um, clusters quite clearly, but you've got to find clever ways in order to be able to sort of detect what's near it. And we'll look at some algorithms in a minute on how we can do that. So then if we go back to our four stage process, we've got stage three and four, ask a, uh, ask a question and get a predicted answer. Now, we're all PHP developers. I hope you know how to call methods and use echo. Um, so I'm not going to tell you how to do that. Um, the, 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 that's the simple bit, right? So let's have a look, have a look at some algorithms. Uh, first of all, we're going to look at one called least squares. It's a very um, uh, basic algorithm. It's something that some of you might have done at, uh, at school or college. Um, and essentially what it is, it's a, it's a line of best fit. Um, for those of you that didn't do maths or computer science or statistics at sort of a college level, um, when, when you were at school and you had to draw a line of best fit, it was kind of a thing of, you kind of look at, look at all the points and you're like, they kind of go in that direction and it's probably roughly like that and you get your ruler out and then you pen, mark it in pencil and then your teacher looks at it and they're like, mm, yeah, it kind of looks all right, so I'll give that a tick. We're, we as humans can do that. We can, we can look at something and say, eh, it's kind of like around that. A machine can't do that. It needs an algorithm to work something out. And one of these algorithms is a least squares regression line. It's not the most ideal one for every situation. The line is always straight. Sometimes the relationship might be curved, for example. Um, but it works in a lot of different situations. So let's look at the, the maths behind it. Um, there's going to be a bit of maths and statistics in this talk, which is actually basically what computer science really is. Um, if you don't like maths, I'm really sorry. Um, if you do like maths, then yay. I like maths too. Um, so let's have a look at some maths. First of all, we need to look at the equation of a line, because that's what we're trying to achieve, right? We're trying to achieve a line. Um, who knows about the equation of a line? Just give me kind of a, an idea. OK, about sort of 3 quarters. So in order to form a line, um, it's an equation in the form a plus bx equals y. Um, so let's break that down, what that actually means. Um, so a, the a part of it, and you can't see this actually at the bottom. So the a part of it, the first variable, um, would be a number, as would b. So a line might be 3 plus 4x equals y. That's a straight line. And where you get the a variable is where it intersects with your y axes. So in this case, it would be 5. That makes sense? Yeah? Great. Um, and then the b value is all about how steep the line is. So the way you actually work it out is by how many it goes along, by how many it goes up. So I can... Oh, um, I can see that this line, it goes across sort of uh, to 32 from 0, and it goes up 5, because it goes from 5 to 10, um, 5 to 10, and it goes across to sort of 32. So I can say b, in this case, is about 6.5. Um, so the equation of this particular line would be 5 plus 6.5x equals y. And the reason that then works, the x equals y, is I can then plug in any x value into that equation, and I can get the y value. So it then becomes an infinite line in that I could say, OK, what is, I could put 50 into that x value, and I would get 5 plus 6.5 uh, times 50. And I would get that y value, which is probably about, I don't know, 12 and a half. Um, so I can, that's how you build your line, a plus bx equals y. So that's what we're trying to get to. Um, so the process of this least squares regression line. Every point has an x and y value on a line. We need an equation of a line. So what we do is we create an infinite number of lines. We create every possible line we can. Um, and every time we do that, we draw a box. And one of the points needs to be on the line that you've just drawn. And um, the other point will be on one of the points on your, on, your, on your graph. So say you have 10 points on your graph, you'll have 10 boxes. And the line that is the correct line is the one where the sum of all of the area of all of those squares is the smallest. Now, I appreciate that's quite hard to actually understand in text form, so let's have a look at what that actually looks like um, uh, with a sort of visualization. Uh, that's not helpful. Okay, my display isn't mirroring, so I'm just going to have to try and do this. Apologies for sort of having to look backwards. Um, OK, so what we've got here is, um, and this is just a nice website. Um, I can't actually read the sort of source of it up there um, uh, from, from this sort of angle, but um, it's just sort of a useful online resource I found. Did this as a nice demo. My JavaScript is not that great anymore. Um, so the equation of a line here is basically this first thing that I can change is the A in my line. 
um, plus this other variable here, b, um, hand size is x and height is y. And I can change these variables and it will move the line on this sort of chart below. So if I change the a value, um, you can see that line goes up and down. So when I said was saying earlier that that's what it changes, it changes the point that it intersects on the, uh, the y-axis, um, we can see it does that. So it goes up and down like that. Um, and the second one, as I said, changes the steepness of the line. So you can see it's getting steeper there and it's getting less steeper. And what we're looking for is when the sum of all the squares, which is helpfully sort of visualized here on the right-hand side, is the smallest. So we can see that that's obviously not the right line. And we can see that that's obviously not the right line. We can see it's sort of somewhere in between. So I think the actual correct one here is about 1 uh, plus 0x. There we go. So that's roughly the right one. And so what I was saying earlier about the points is, um, so this square here, we have one point that's on the line, and we have another point, another corner that's on another one of the points. So that's how we're essentially doing it. Uh, if I come back. Okay. Um, so... What I'm now going to do is I'm now going to try and do that in PHP using a library called PHPML. Try, try and drag across there. Uh, can you read that at the back? Great. Um, so what we're doing here is we're doing our four-step machine learning process. We're using this library called PHPML to actually do sort of the underlying stuff uh, algorithm for us. But I'll explain how that works in a moment. Um, so what are, our, what, what are our four stages in our machine learning process? What's step number one? Acquire data. Um, so you can see that on lines eight and nine. Um, we essentially have our x and y values. The reason that there um, is a raise, um, it's an array of arrays on the, for the samples is because you might be working in more than two dimensions. Um, that's quite hard to graph, so I haven't really talked about it, but you might be working in 12 dimensions, for example. Um, so eight and nine, we're acquiring our data. Step number two, train our model. Train our model. Um, so that's what we're doing on lines uh, 11 and 12. So we're grabbing a least squares um, object, a, mo a model, a service, um, and we train it with our data. Stage three, ask it a question. Um, so it's where we're running the predict method. And stage four, get our predicted answer, um, echo. Um, so in this case, I'm giving it the value 65. Um, and if I run that, that says 4.2. So great, it's given me an answer. But I've already told it what uh, 65 is. I've told it that it's 4.1. Um, so why is it why is it made a mistake? Um, now, as we sort of saw earlier with the least squares regression line, it doesn't go through every point. It can't. Otherwise, if you had an anomaly, it would throw off your data set. What if you had more than one that was 65? So it won't be exactly precise. It's only an estimate. It's only a prediction. It's as close as it can be. It's like trying to catch a, catch a tennis ball. Um, you know, sometimes you, you try and get there. You try and kind of estimate where it's going to go. Um, sometimes you don't catch it, and sometimes you do. Um, and the more training you've had, the more sort of times that you've tried to catch a tennis ball in your life, um, hopefully the better at catching the tennis ball you are. Um, so it just comes down to sort of, uh, but there, there will be anomalies. You will, you will occasionally not catch that ball. Um, if any of you follow baseball, you know, I'm sure you've seen sort of amazing players miss a ball occasionally. It happens. Um, and it will happen the same here. But then if I change this value from 65 and I change it to 61, so here it was an overestimate. I told it it was 4.1 it came out with 4.2. But if I run 61, I might grab that then it tells me it's 3.4, uh, 3.4, uh, 3 3.5, sorry, um, which I've told it is 3.6, so then it's under. And if you add up all the differences between what I've told it and what the value it actually comes out with, then you'll end up with zero. It will all even out in the end. Um, very magical and sort of nice and resol resolving at the end. Um, so if I come back to this. Uh, so that's the PHPML library. It's a really nice little library to use. Um, it doesn't handle memory very well, um, so uh, which is one of the disadvantages you will have with trying to do machine learning in PHP. I'll talk about, about that in a bit. Um, 
so you might have issues with like huge data sets trying to push that into it. It also doesn't handle floating point precision because generally PHP doesn't. Um, uh, but it is a nice library to sort of get started and have a play with. Um, and the code's in the slides as well, which I'll publish after the talk if you're interested. Um, how that actually works as an algorithm, because obviously we don't have a big for each loop for every single possible line. Um, now, I added this slide because people always ask me this question, how does this actually work under the hood? Um, but I also appreciate that there's quite some complex, like, fundamental maths that's required to kind of understand this, um, namely matrices and how they work. So if any of you know how matrices worked, because you did maths at uh, college, then what you do is you turn this, um, both of these, uh, the samples and targets into matrices. Um, you then transpose it. You then do some matrix multiplication. You inverse the matrix, multiply it by the other one, um, uh, and the, uh, by the sorry, by the other one which you've transposed, and then you multiply it by the other one, um, and then you multiply them both together, and then you read off your coefficients and your um, intercepts. I appreciate that's quite complicated, particularly if you don't understand how matrices work. So it's more just kind of a thing there if you want to go back to the slides and investigate how matrices work afterwards. If you know how matrices work, there you go. Um, and I'm more than happy to chat about that afterwards if you, any of you are interested. Um, another algorithm we're going to talk about is nearest neighbor. So nearest neighbor is all about clustering um, and being able to sort of group things together. So here what we've got is we've got a series of different points. This is our training set. Um, and everything is either red, blue, or green. Great. Um, now, eventually what I'd do is I'd work out an algorithm and I would serialize it. And the way it would serialize it would be a bit like this. So if I asked it what the point was here, sort of where my red dot of my clicker is, if you can see that, um, then it would, it would estimate that that was uh, blue. If I put another one here, it would estimate it as red. Um, now again, as you can see, there are mistakes. Um, there's some sort of uh, green points up here in the red blob, there's a blue point down here, um, uh, there's sort of another red bit inside this, this green blob down here. So it kind of really depends as to kind of how, how that ends up working. Um, I appreciate you can't really see all the green points actually on the projector as well, but there are green points there as you can kind of see across. Um, so how does that work? How does, how does this algorithm work? And this one isn't too mathsy, um, so if you don't like maths, this is, uh, this is your algorithm. Um, so I'm, I'm a human, um, and I like friends. Um, I've never really had many. Um, so I, what, what, when I'm trying to work out what I am, I turn to my friends. And I haven't got many, so I, only, I turn to my three, my three friends, my three closest friends, um, and I say, what are you guys? Um, and two of them turn around and say, hey, I'm a red triangle. And one of them says, I'm a blue square. Um, and again, human nature, I sort of turn towards the majority. Um, I say, okay, I'm probably a red triangle then. And that's how it works. Um, it's, it's, you simply look at the, the, the X nearest points, in this case three, the three, the three nearest points, and you say, what are the rest of those? And then you identify as whatever the majority of them are. Um, you'll, you'll normally use a, um, a odd number because it's more likely to, it's less likely to produce um, uh, a, um, a tie, uh, but it is possible. You could have one, uh, one of them could have been red, one of them could have been blue, one of them could have been green. Um, so you can get that issue where you have a tie, and we'll, we'll see that um, in a minute. You can also change this value. So I said this is, this is, this is a three nearest neighbor. The, the algorithm is called a K nearest neighbor. So you can put whatever number you, in, you want in there, and you have to choose a number that's appropriate for your data set. So if I look at my five nearest friends, I have more friends now, um, and I want to talk to my five, five closest friends and ask them what they are, then I actually change what, what I think I am. Previously, uh, my, um, I thought I was a red triangle, but now I'm looking at the closest five, and three of them are blue squares. So now I'm a blue, uh, I, I would identify as a blue square. And honestly, looking at this data set, I've got no idea which of those two is correct. Um, you've just got to try and sort of see and, uh, uh, and apply this to various different situations and come up with a number that suits your data set. Um, I mentioned about ties. So for example here where you see that there's no color, um, that's because essentially there's a tie. The three closest points would be all the same. So up here in the top right hand corner for example, if I look at the three closest points, one of them is blue, one of them is green, one of them is red. Therefore I've got no idea what I would be and I just say I've got no idea. Um, and that's a perfectly valid answer. Um, so, let's have a look at that in PHP.
Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, so, going back to our four stages of machine learning, what is stage number one? Acquire data, yeah. So that's lines eight and nine. We can see that we've got our X and Y values and then whatever we're classifying it as. So classifying it's A, but it might be green, it might be blue, um, like it was in the previous example. We've just got A and B here. So point one three is A, point one four is A, point three one is B, point four one is B, point four two is a B, and so on and so forth. Um, step number two. Train our model, yeah. Um, so that's on a lines 11 and 12. Um, so we grab our k nearest neighbors and we tr do a train, um, uh, passing in that data. Step number three, ask a question. Ask a question. Um, we run predict and we're trying to find out 0.15. Um, step number four, get our predicted answer. So if I run this with 1.5, um, then we can see down here, very small, there we go. Uh, we can see it's identifying that as A, um, and I've got another one here that is uh, that I'm is recommending I put, which is three two, and I can run that, and that will be B. Now, that sounds very academic. I've got no idea if those are actually A and B. I can't really visualize it. Um, so earlier, when I was talking about um, graphs, and I was saying about how helpful they were. Okay, sorry. Um, this is the data that we did have before. This was our training set. Um, and if we add our extra two points that we just did, one, five, and three, two, we can see that they, they, they make sense, right? The, the one that's sort of red what goes with the reds, and the one that was blue went with the blues. Um, so great, it, it trained our set successfully. And you could put in whatever values that you wanted to. It's just I knew I had those in my next slide. And again, I've got my code there. So. Um, Every time I mention that I'm doing a talk that is called Machine Learning and Trend Analysis in PHP, people are like, why on earth would you do that in PHP? Uh, what are you doing with your life? Um, and there are completely valid reasons to use PHP for this. So for example, let's say you're a PHP shop. You've got 20 PHP developers um, working there, and one guy knows Python. Um, great for that guy. And Python, Python is a better language for machine learning. I'm not going to deny that. Um, but realistically, if you then develop some machine learning stuff um, that was done in Python, and that person then leaves that knows PHP and Python, you've either got to hire another person who knows PHP and Python, um, or you've got to hire a Python developer and a PHP developer in order to fill that role. So realistically, if you're a PHP shop and you have 20 PHP developers and you're just doing some low-level uh, machine learning, um, and it's not a hugely core part of your business. You don't want to spend, I don't know, 60K a year on it or however much um, developers get paid in San Francisco. Then, which is, yeah, quite. Um, then, uh, um, realistically, just do it in PHP because you can. And um, the issues, the main issues you come across are generally floating point precision, um, uh, lack of algorithms sort of already built, um, and uh, memory management. Um, memory management and floating point precision you can get away with if you just do some, if you write your own PHP extension and if you were listening to Jeremy's talk earlier, um, then hopefully you've got a better idea of how you might be able to do that. Um, alternatively, you can just use the PHP ML library which works really nicely with sort of smaller sets of data. Um, when I say small, I mean like a couple of gig is fine. Um, terabytes, maybe not. Um, the other reason you might want to use PHP is, so what we do a lot um, uh, at Sam Knows, for example, is we create a model and serialize it uh, in Python uh, or Go. Um, and then we might do step three and four, getting the predicted answer um, and asking it a question might be done in PHP. Um, so you're doing different parts of this four-step process in different languages. But ultimately, you want your PHP developers to be understanding of how, uh, how that process works. Or you might just want to empower your PHP developers to be able to do small little operations inside an existing piece of business logic um, to use existing services, existing entities, and all of that kind of stuff. So PHP does make sense for this. It's, it's an interesting choice, but there are definitely valid reasons to do it. Um, so. um, and finally, I just want to talk about some uses of machine learning, just in case you haven't heard of enough on the internet and heard about Skynet. Um, so numerical analysis, you can do a whole bunch of, and that's kind of what I focus on more in this talk, I haven't really talked about um, anything like natural language processing or vision or speech detection or anything like that. Fault detection, 
So who has um, Apache uh, access logs? Or Nginx access logs or whatever. Um, who uses them for anything other than um, uh, one of your mobile developers said that they made a request and you can't find any uh, indication this request actually happened, so you go into the Apache access logs to prove that they didn't actually happen. Who uses it for anything else? Okay, one person. Your Apache access logs, um, one, they're there for a reason, um, and two, they're amazing sources of information. Um, imagine that you do a deploy uh, of a new product, um, and then suddenly your 404s go up. Like, that's an important thing, because it may be that you've removed an asset that was being referenced by your mobile app, um, or maybe you've actually just broken a part of your website. Um, you can also do this for the obvious thing of detecting 500s, um, uh, or detecting sort of 422s for validation, or anything like this, and seeing spikes maybe of certain things after a deploy. Um, so you can use it for kind of fault detection on things like your Apache access. And that's something everyone in this room can go home and do today, um, assuming that you actually have those logs. If you don't, start them and then use it. Um, step one. Step one, acquire data. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, another thing you can use them for is e-commerce. Who works with e-commerce of some kind? Um, yeah, most of you. Um, that's a very common thing in PHP, right? Now. Machine learning, the, the, one of the whole places that collecting data on customers came from was like supermarkets and loyalty cards detecting that actually people who buy this product and that product also often buy that product, so let's put them in the same place in the supermarket. Um, and that was a very real world example. But how many people have bought a product on Amazon simply because Amazon suggested you might be interested in it? Yeah, like quite a few of you. Um, and multiply that by everyone that's ever used Amazon, and they're making hundreds of thousands just simply off of suggesting you might want to buy a thing. Um, so machine learning, in that kind of sense, looking at trends and that, and that kind of thing, can greatly increase your revenue. Um, root cause analysis, if you're interested in kind of like looking into issues, um, if you're on an analytics platform or something like that. Classification. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Chris Holt, did a project with Joined In. Uh, by the way, everyone remember Joined In, rate the talks, uh, speakers, we really appreciate it. Um, he did a thing to automatically tag events um, so that different uh, um, uh, events on Joined In would have tags like PHP or Symphony or Laravel, for example. Um, and he then also sort of took that further and sort of started running it on, on news websites. So he ran it on New York Times web, uh, um, uh, uh, news articles and sort of got, got them to automatically tag. And it tagged an article about emails with Hillary Clinton, for example. Um, so that kind of also highlights this whole thing of machine learning can go wrong, be careful. That's a very bad political mistake uh, to make, quite literally political. Um, Natural language processing, analysis of support queries. Suddenly your support queries go up about a particular product just after you do a deploy, you probably made a mistake. Or trying to improve your FAQs. Um, analysis of large numbers of documents. If any of you have ever been involved in like a litigation process or a legal process, um, uh, one of the things you do is discovery. So you bombard the other side with as many documents as you possibly can. So they don't find that one document that says, yes, I did want you to kill her for me. Um, <laughs> And, um, and like, th but this genuinely happens. They'll bombard you with as many documents as possible so you don't find that incriminating piece of evidence. Um, now, law firms would then have to hire thousands of people to go through that documents, or they can hire a team of machine learning engineers um, to uh, basically, and one of my friends works doing this, um, they analyze all of those documents as soon as they come through, and within a couple of days, they've, they've found that, um, basically what's important and what's not, um, just simply by machines instead of, so, so it can save you huge amounts of money in that kind of situation. And there's so much more you can do. Um, I'm not gonna go into all of, sort of the examples, but primarily, machine learning is fun. Um, there's a nice library that you can just go and play with. That's how I got into it. Um, and then hopefully you can find something that can provide value to your, uh, value to your business. Um, and then the pay rise, um, if you, you know, happen to invent Amazon suggesting you buy new products or whatever. Um, so yeah, go, and have, go away, have fun. Um, make sure you start acquiring your data even if you're not doing anything else. Um, and thank you very much. Um, now, we don't really have time for questions, I believe. No, no, okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, but if you want to ask questions, come grab me afterwards. Um, I'll be out there in the break. Um, so yeah, thank you very much.